How many of y'all are glad you came to church this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. Great crowd, man. Great crowd. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for such a great day, such a great crowd, such a great worship, such a great bunch of kids that are learning about you and singing to you, Father. Lord, I just ask you to continue to pour your spirit out on us the rest of this service. And uh, Lord, I ask you to multiply the food and get it ready in plenty of time. And, and Lord, uh, help all of our visitors to stay so we can get acquainted with them better. But Lord, most of all, I ask you to bring your anointing on your word today. And I ask you just to, to move my heart and my mind, Father, and just work through it this morning to bring what you want us to hear, Father, from your heart to our heart, Father. And help us to hear your word and obey your word, Father, and help it to make us grow in our relationship with you. And Lord, open our ears to hear and our eyes to see this morning, Father. And don't let any person leave here this morning without coming into a relationship with you and without knowing that you've touched us today, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Excuse me a minute. This thing's not right. We don't have to hand them down off the stage anymore. I went and bought two more. Amen. So it's going to work. Uh, how many of y'all said you're glad you're here this morning? Okay. Well, my prayer is, is that when you leave, you'll still be glad you were here, okay? Uh, how many of you think that uh, the book of Malachi is, is only about one thing? How many of you know what's usually preached out of the book of Malachi chapter 3? Hello, there's two over there, huh? Well... Uh, Malachi is a lot, about a lot more than that, and, uh, but it's a significant thing, and uh, I, I don't, uh, haven't in the past preached very much about money, and uh, that's, that's not right. I have not grown you the way and, and equipped you to, to grow the way that I should have, because I've just not preached about it enough, okay? Very, very little, in fact. And uh, if you're new here, you know, and you don't know it, or if you're not, uh, you know, I do this job out of love for God and because I want to. I don't do it for money. In fact, I don't get paid. I, I'm a volunteer, okay, just like most of you are. And, uh, and I just want you to know that. But I want you to know, uh, and some of you are probably sitting there already thinking, you know, he's doing this because they got a little problem in their budget. And, and, uh, and you're right. And, and he's probably thinking, you know, I'll preach on money and they'll give a lot more. And I am kind of hoping that a little bit. You know, we could use a little bit more. How many of you know it takes money to make the kingdom of God work? Do we know that? Okay. And, uh, but, but the main reason that I'm preaching it, the main reason, well, no, the main reason is because I believe that's what God led me to do. But I believe he led me to do it because... Your giving and your finances and what you do with your money is the biggest single thermometer of how your relationship with God is going. And, and if you don't know that, you need to know that. And if you want a deeper, better relationship with, with the Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, then if you're not giving, we can make it better today, okay? Okay. And, and there's some things I'm going to tell you today. And this may not be just a one-time sermon. We may have a follow-up next week. Because to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly where it's all going. But I know that God wants us to understand His economy. And I know that He wants us to place our faith in Him. And not in your employer. Not in your checkbook. Not in your investments. Not in anything except Him. And so, y'all just bear with me today as, as I hope God's going to speak to us. Uh, but in, in Malachi chapter 1, Malachi is about returning to God. That's what Malachi is about. The last chapter is about Jesus coming back, okay? But the first three chapters, 
The first chapter is about uh, returning to Him in your worship and, and, and making your personal devotion and worship to Him. That's what the first chapter is about. The second chapter is, is about your need to return to Him as far as the family's concerned and for husbands and wives to glorify Him by their relationship with each other. Uh, in Ephesians, the, the marriage relationship is a picture of what our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be like. And, uh, and, and how many of you know a lot of times our relationship with our wives and husbands, it doesn't reflect the glory of God. Hello? But if we do it the way God tells us to, we'll not only be happy and prosperous and we'll not only have happy wives and husbands, we'll have a better relationship with God and we'll be a better witness for Him. Is that true or not? Amen? Amen? But in the third chapter, uh, he says you need to return to me in your giving and in your finances and in your trust for me. That's what it's about. Uh, uh, and, and in case you still don't know it, your finances and what you do with them reflect how much you trust God. If you were to show me your checkbook or your, your bank statement or your check register, for the last three months, I can tell you what your relationship with God is. Easily and quickly. Because where you spend your money reflects what your priorities are. And it reflects what you trust in. And, uh, and that's just a fact. But let's start out in Malachi 3. And uh, verse 1, okay? I think we got it. Oh my goodness, I'm glad I'm not reading it up there. You can see it better up there. Okay, it says, Behold... I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? How many of y'all right now with your lives and your finances and everything else about you would just be jumping for joy if if you were to see the Lord descending slowly in from heaven? Would you really, or would some of you be a little frightened? Hello? I hope here we understand His grace and His mercy and His love, and I hope we would all shout for joy, but there's lots of people over this world that if they thought He was coming back tomorrow, they would start making drastic changes in their lives today. Hello? But how many of you know that He's not going to judge you by what you're doing or what you've done but by who you know and who you've placed your trust in, okay? we got to keep that straight. Uh, as we talk about finances, you have, to, you have to remember your priorities. In fact, I believe that, uh, that as we go through Malachi, it's about priorities. Uh, you, you, could, you could title the message priorities, or, or you could title it, how to walk in the supernatural. How many of you think that you can be greedy and hoard your money and not tithe and not give money and walk in the supernatural and see miracles in your life? What do you have to do to see miracles in your life and signs and wonders following you? Huh? You have to believe. You have to trust in the Lord your God. And you have to place all of your trust in Him. That's what moves Him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you have to live by faith. And, and we can, I can tell you from my own personal experience, we can think we're walking in faith and later be shown that we're trusting in something else more than we're trusting in God. And uh, how many of you know that, that you can be deceived in that area? Hello? Uh, anyway, uh, who can endure his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire and the launderer's soap. Anybody want to go through the laundry? How about through the refiner's fire? How many of you have been through the refiner's fire? Some of you are either asleep or not voting or something. Uh, either that or you're, I don't know. How many of you have been through the refiner's fire at some point in your life? Okay, now most of you I know are awake. Uh, we, we all go through there. Uh, he uses our circumstances. He uses our, our choices. He uses our sowing and reaping. He uses everything 
to bring us to our knees before Him. He doesn't cause those things to happen, I don't believe, but He uses everything that goes on in our life. He works all things together for good to those that love Him that are called according to His purpose. So whatever's going on in your life, the chances are very, very strong that He's allowing it to happen for you to throw your full and undivided attention on Him and to get on your knees and to lift your arms to Him and to cry out and say, God, I can't do this anymore without you. I need you. Please come and rescue me. That's what he wants from us. He wants our, our total and undivided attention, okay? And there's so many things that can distract us from it. And some of us could even be distracted as we're speaking today and not even be aware of it. My prayer is, is that he will illuminate that part of the scripture that applies to you today and use it to change your life in a constructive way. Um, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. When you offer your offerings, do you offer it in righteousness? Do you offer it because he made you righteous? Do you offer it because he set you free and he saved your soul and died for your sins? Do you give your offerings for that? Or do you give your offerings thinking that it's going to get you somewhere else with him? Hello? Our motive is important. It's always important. In everything we do with God, our motive is important. Uh, That he may purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, and in the days of, as in the days of old and in the former years. And then he says, and I will come near you for judgment. Now what does it stir up in your mind when it says, I'll come near you for judgment? It could stir up some negative things in your heart if you haven't dealt with your past and your issues, if you don't understand his righteousness and if you don't understand the forgiveness of sin totally and that he forgave us 2,000 years ago on the cross, and, and you don't know that your sin is eradicated, it could stir up some scary things in, in, in us. And it does in some people who don't really know the whole truth. But it says, uh, he says, I'll come for, uh, near you for judgment. And now listen, it says, I'll be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away from an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So who's he going to judge? He's going to judge our enemies if we're in him, if we're walking in his righteousness and his grace and his mercy and his love, and if we're touched by him, saved by him, made righteous by him, he's going to judge our enemies. These folks are our enemies, amen? They're the unbelievers, That's who he's going to judge. He says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. I do not change. You know, I think sometimes when when we study the Old Testament and we study the New Testament and we study grace versus law and righteousness through him versus those that try to find righteousness through the law, I think sometimes we can, can think God changes. How many of you, when God says, I do not change, that's exactly what he means. I do not change. Amen? You know, God has already been in existence for eternity past. And he will be in existence for eternity future. Do you know how long that means God will be in existence? Forever. He has been forever and he will be forever. Okay? But... He doesn't change. Whatever God says, he lives by. Whatever God tells you, he lives by. Whatever God says in his word, he lives by. And he doesn't change. We can look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and if we're not careful, we can can think he changes, but he's never changed. Uh, It says, Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet the days of your father you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And then some of you may have said this, and you know, but, but you said, well, in what way shall we return to you? 
You know, some of you might be thinking right now, man, I'm as close to God as I'll ever be. And that might be true. If he's living in you, how much closer can you get than that? But are you aware that just because he's living in you, that doesn't mean you submit to him every day of your life? What, what should we be doing if we're close to him, if we're loving him, if, we're, if we know the truth and the truth has set us free? What should we be doing? We should be submitting our lives to him. We should be obeying what he's told us to do, shouldn't we? Do we come under a curse if we don't obey? Do we live under grace or law? Grace. We live under grace. But grace, if you understand grace, will make you want to do what God says is right for you, will it not? The law didn't pass away. It was fulfilled, okay? You have gone away from my ordinances and not kept them, but you say, in what way shall we return? And then in verse 8, uh, he starts talking about how we, how we have gone away and how should we return. Will a man rob God? Now, uh, if, if I'm God and I'm carrying a big sack of money, which one of you girls would come up to me with a, with a weapon and say, give me that money? You would? If I was God? I didn't think so. There might, there might be some mean-looking guys out here that would, but certainly not a young lady like you. But, you know, we wouldn't deliberately rob God, would we? As believers, as, as good Christian people, as, as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, most of us would not consciously rob God. But we do every day, some of us. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes. And offerings. In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. The, this whole nation bring all of the tithes. How much? Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse. Why? That there may be food in my house. Strange that he should say that and it should come out this morning. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in the house. How many of y'all got the email this week that said, uh, this is covered this Sunday and please bring enough for yourself and your family and for our visitors and for someone else? How many of you got that email? Well, no wonder we don't have enough food today. No, no wonder for the second time. Do y'all read your emails? How many of you were here last Sunday? How many of you saw the announcement up there that said next week's covered dish, please, please, please bring food, you know, enough? Well, I had to give them money and they had to go to the store again today to have enough food to feed this wonderful, great crowd. And, and, and Roxy said to me when she told me, and I said, well, here, let me give you some money. She says, she says you said last week you weren't going to do that again. And I said, yeah, but did you see the crowd, you know? We can't let them go without eating. And if I'd have been Jesus, I'd just said, here, come let me break the bread. And maybe that's what I should have done. But I'm, I'm just taking out a minute to encourage you. When we have covered dish, how many of you know that all these beautiful ladies from, from New Life, how many did you bring this morning, Laurie? Twelve girls. Twelve girls. We have twelve extra girls here, or more, sometimes more, uh, Every first Sunday of the month. Because, you know, they don't care about my preaching and, and, you know. But they come to eat. Amen. Well, I have a better idea. Why don't we just all give of our time and give of ourselves and bring food? It's a covered dish lunch. Okay, that means... Everybody brings something except the visitors. We've always told our visitors, you eat, whether you brought something or not, we want you to stay, we want to fellowship with you. And I didn't really mean to get carried away with this, but this is part of giving. If you're not giving of yourself and your time to, to pay attention to, to what we're trying to do to, to, to win people to Jesus and to make people feel full and comfortable so they can, can serve Him, then are we, are we giving... 
graciously and wonderfully and excitedly to God? You know? How many of you like covered dish? Oh, how many of you raised your hands a while ago that you brought something today? Uh, well, it was, on the, it was on the announcements last Sunday, wasn't it, Brandy? Yeah, okay. So, and it was in the bulletin too, wasn't it? How many of y'all read the bulletin? How many of y'all read the roundup every week? Yeah, if you're visiting today, excuse us. We're just taking care of a little housekeeping encouragement, okay? Now let's get back to what we were doing. Uh, if, if y'all robbed God in the food, I, I forgive you, okay? Uh, <clears throat> in tithes and offerings, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. How many of you would like some more food in your refrigerator at home? Huh? How many of you would like a little more money in your pocket to put a little more food in your refrigerator? Maybe a higher quality of steak or maybe, you know, more of your favorite food. You got to give if you want to receive, okay? It's more blessed to give than to receive. But if you give, you receive. And, you, and it's in like kind. We're going to go through that after a while if I get there. Uh, blessings are great. But uh, what, what, if, what, if, what if something's always going wrong? How many of y'all have a broken refrigerator or appliance at home right now? Don't raise your hand. I don't want you to do that. How many of you have problem with stuff breaking and you continually replacing stuff or, or it gets lost and you can't find it and you can't use it and you, and you need other things? Anybody? Uh, oh, that's... Huh? Oh, no, that was about that other thing, not this. But, um, but, but listen to this verse 11. It says, he says, he says, I will open the heaven for, uh, windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing such that you cannot receive it. And then he says, and, so that's not all he does. He doesn't just open the windows of heaven. He's going to pour out stuff on you. But what would happen in your life if, if the income increased and, and the abundance of what God pours out on you, if it increases, but what would happen if the negative impact of life and living and time and rust, what would happen if that stopped? And you, had to, and, you, and you could quit replacing things and you could quit spending money on things that wore out and, and you, could, you could have stuff that would work a long time. How long did the clothes and the shoes and stuff last on the children of Israel when they spent 40 years in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. 40 years. You know, I have a t-shirt that's 50 years old. Okay, I will. It's got one little moth hole in it. And I don't know when I bought it, but I've had it for eons. Amen. Uh, anyway, uh, and he, he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit in your field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. See, if we believe in Him and we trust Him and we do what He says because we love Him and because of what we understand He did for us, I don't believe the average Christian understands fully what God did for us on that cross. I, I really don't think most of them do. But when you come to understand it, then your heart changes. And you're not doing things for God out of a wrong motive, you're doing things for God out of a right motive because you're so appreciative that He loved you, that He chose you, that He died for you, that He forgave all of your sins, and that He's there for you and that He lives in you. When you get all of that, your motives change, your life changes, and then, you, and then you're excited to give. And I know we got a lot of givers in here, and you guys don't get discouraged, but, but I know some of us are not giving the way God wants us to give. If we all were giving the way God says to give, we'd have a new building out there. How many of you know we need a new building? Well, that's three of us. 
gosh. And one of them is my wife. We need a new building for youth. We need a gym. We need, there's a lot of things that we need. We need we, we're trying to pay off the building, and we made a pretty good start a couple of months ago. And, and we've had some ideas about how to have more of the fundraisers and pay off the building, but there's only a few people that made suggestions, and I don't have time to, to bring all of that stuff about. Somebody's got to pick up that ball. And, and somebody's got to help make that happen. We owe 140, 148 or $9,000 on the building. And if we would pay it off and you would increase your giving still in, in accordance with God's word and your income, you know, this isn't about this church. Doing what God says to do in the finances is about His kingdom. What's the Great Commission? <coughs> Go, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. To the last thing Jesus said before he ascended up to heaven was go into all the world preaching the gospel and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things. Now we can each go and do that in our own little sphere but if we're giving into the storehouse, and if the storehouse has the right heart and the right mind, and, and we're doing kingdom stuff, then, then we can spread the gospel. And we are spreading the gospel. Uh, Dennis and Paula are the chairman of our missions committee. And our missions committee for a small church, I think, is doing some great things. We're supporting several missionaries. And, and we're always looking to help folks that need help and, and finding ways to spread the gospel and to get the word out about our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's something that needs to get out. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, he says, uh, he says, For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, and then he says, to him, he says, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Uh, y'all don't, any of y'all know you don't fit into that, and you've probably never said these things. He says, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? And then he says, you have said, it's useless to serve God. <whistles> Anybody ever said, well, you know, God hasn't done anything for me. What, what's the use of serving him? If God hadn't done anything for you, you need to come talk to me. Okay? Because uh, he's waiting to. What profit is it if we've kept his ordinances and we've walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call on the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. I had someone that I know pretty well just, just kind of say that same thing to me just a few days ago. You know, there's people that, that just don't understand God. And, and there's people that, that think if he loves them, he'd give them everything they want. Uh, some of us may have been there. But then verse 16 says, Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another. And y'all ever do that? Speak to one another about what's going on in your life? Uh, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a, a book of remembrances was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on, that, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between righteousness and between the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. God wants us to love him, and he wants us to be obedient to what he tells us to do, and he wants us to spread the kingdom. Go ye therefore into all nations. And all of us can't go into all nations, but how many of us can go and spread the word in our block, on our street, with our neighbors, at the grocery store, wherever we go? Can we do it? Are we doing it? Some of us are doing it. I know some of us are. And that's good. But what if all of us, this is probably one of the biggest crowds we've had in a while. What if everybody walked out of this room today 
more excited about God and more committed to, to give into the kingdom and to tell everybody they meet about Jesus, what would happen in our community? That's what it's about. It's not about big and building bigger buildings. It's not about uh, being able to pay our, our youth minister a living wage so she doesn't have to work at three different jobs and fulfill all these places just to be able to pay her bills. It's not about just being able to, to give more into our missions committee so that we can, can support more missionaries and, and help get the gospel out more places. It's about us giving our whole heart to God and doing what He calls us to do. It's about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whether we like it or not, it takes money to do that. And, and you know, my son decided uh, years ago that, that uh, he was going to start going to church. And, uh, and uh, this has probably got something to do with why I don't preach on money much. But uh, they were having a revival at a church in New Braunfels, and we were part of that church, and they had a really great speaker in there. And he'd been preaching for, he was going to be there for a week. And so uh, my son said, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to come Wednesday. And uh, he'd had some issues with church and stuff. And, and uh, so he came Wednesday, and guess what they preached about? And guess when, how long it's been since he went to church? It just soured him. But it shouldn't sour us. It's part of the gospel. Giving is, is, a, is a thermometer for our obedience and our relationship to God. How many of you know that God loves a cheerful giver? Will He bless you if you give? What if you give in order to get Him to bless you? Will He bless you then? We could get into a real can of worms with that. But he says, test me. He says, test me. If your heart is, is not for him, if your heart's, you know, even, even lost people that, that are benevolent, that, that, uh, that give to charitable causes, how do you think they got rich? They got rich because they were generous. And God blessed their generosity. And, and if we have a heart for God, and if we're giving out of abundance, out of the abundance, how many of you know that whatever you got came from God? Huh? Whatever you got came from, look at the person that's sitting next to you that you're married to, and say, hey, you came from God. For me. Hello? And if, you, if you're not happy about that, then come see me after the service and we'll talk about it. And I'll get you happy with it, okay? God wants you to be happy with that because He gave it to you. Hello? I didn't hear that. I think I'm glad. Uh, look at... Uh, look at James... 1, verse 16. It says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of, of turning. Uh, and if you go to the first part of James, James 1, 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So all good things come from God, and, but we still go through trials. How many of you have been through a trial recently? And it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be and lacking lacking what lacking in nothing see God wants you to have everything but he wants you to get it by going through the trials and letting the trials bring you closer to him and opening your heart to him and falling in love with him and getting in love with his word so that you can 
can grow and you can study to show yourself to prove unto God a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And he's waiting to give you stuff. But, but who gets in the way of him giving you stuff? Huh? What? Who gets in the way of him giving you stuff? Well, there's so many answers, but I heard one that said the evil one, the devil, and, and I heard all kinds of things. But I'm going to tell you what gets mostly in the way of him giving you what you desire and what you want. It's you. It's you. And, and it's not like you earn it, but it's, you know, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And God can be sitting there with just buckets and buckets of stuff just wanting to just open those windows and let it flow down. And you're out there sowing weeds. Planting weeds and grass burrs in your yard. And he's saying, man, if you'd quit that, if you'd quit that, you're keeping all that beautiful lush grass from coming up and all that wheat and corn, you're keeping it from coming up by planting grass burrs. How many of you like grass burrs? My, my brother-in-law one time, he moved out to Seguin after we were already here, and he had lots of sand and everything. And at first I thought, man, I got all these rocks out here at Canyon Lake, and, and that's, that's so horrible and everything. And then I walked through his yard barefooted, and it was full of grass burrs. How many of you know grass burrs grow in sand? Well, rocks are better, in my opinion, <laughs> unless you're building a fence. But um, anyway... Um, where was I? I'll get it in a minute. Do not be deceived. Um, you know, we talk a lot about grace here, and we talk a lot about His righteousness. And, and it's real easy to slip from a mind of grace and righteousness when you're talking about money and when you're talking about serving God and when you're talking about the things that, that he wants us to do and it's the motive because if our motive slides over into keeping the law and being legalistic and doing that because we have to then that's not the right way and it's not the way that brings joy but if we can understand that God loved us so much that he gave his son to die for all of our sins and we are, if we've trusted him and we have that relationship and he's taken away all of our sins all of them past, present, and future then we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And then we, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but man, when I learned that a few years ago, a lot of years ago, I got so excited because I didn't have to earn anything from God. I didn't have to prove anything from God. All I had to do was trust Him and trust in His Son. And, and that and that alone made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and when you get that, you can be a joyful cheerful giver not just in money but in yourself in your relationships in in everything that you do you can be full of life-giving joy and life-giving peace and and you can make your life easier and better uh, You know, in, in Romans 6, 14, uh, Paul said, you know, for sin shall not have dominion over you. He's talking about after you come to Jesus, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but you're under grace. But then he turned right around and he says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Heavens no, he said. Why would he say heavens no? Because when you're doing the things that, that are sinful under the law, you're sowing bad seeds for getting God's blessings. You're, you're doing the opposite of what you need to do to draw near to God and let Him draw near to you and, and to do what He says for the right reason and the right motive. Motive is so important. Uh, look at Galatians 6, verse 7. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in, in doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. You know, have you ever lost heart because things just went so bad for so long? Turn back to the living God. Go to Malachi and, and learn all the three ways that we're supposed to come back to Him. 
and cry out to him and, and study the word and learn who he is, what he did for you and what he wants to do for you. He came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And that's what he wants for us. He wants us to have it more abundantly. Uh, Matthew 5, 21. Jesus talking. He says, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. He says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother it, without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of, of the council. But whoever says you fool will be in danger of hell fire. You know, the, the point I, I want to make there is we think, we think the law is hard and, and, and grace is easy, right? How many of you think that? How many of you believe that? The law is hard and grace is easy. Well, you know, grace is easy because the, the penalties changed. God didn't change. God's still the same. You believe if God said something in the law that it's good for you? Did God tell us to do something that wasn't good for us? But Jesus came. The law said, don't commit adultery. And Jesus, grace and peace personified, he said, don't even think about it. Huh? Now, which one of those would you rather be under? Don't do it or don't even think about it. But you see, there's, there's consequences even if we think about it. How many of you know if you think about something long enough, you do it? Hello? So, the law was good because it showed us that we needed a Savior. And the Savior's good because He actually took us out from under the law. But He gave us a better motive for doing the things that God said. He gave us a motive to get excited about God. I was excited about serving God before I understood grace and righteousness. And you know why I was excited about it? Because I thought if I served God hard enough, I'd get something back. But when I understood grace and righteousness, I got excited about God. I got excited about the fact that He loves me. He loves me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I can't do anything to keep that from happening. No matter what I do, He still says, My Son shed His blood for you, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I love you, and I want to bless you so bad. Please quit planting grass burrs. And if I'm smart which I'm sometimes, I try not to plant any grass burrs. In fact, I even pick grass burrs out of my yard when they spring up. Or I send my wife to do it. She loves to do that. <laughs> and, and she tries to pick the grass burrs out of my yard too. <laughs> how many of y'all like for your wife to pick grass burrs out of your yard and tell you how to do it? Are y'all getting anything I'm saying? There's, there's a better way but, but the way is the way. God said, how many, of you, how many of you debate over whether you should, how many of you know that the tithe is, is uh, at least 10%? How many of you know what a giver is? Do you think if you're tithing, you're a giver? You can't give anything to God until you give him what's his. The tithe is his. Actually, everything you got is his, but he says, I'll let you use the rest. You just give me my tenth of it. Let, you know, let, me, let me explain it to you this way. Uh, let's say that uh, Clark you know, uh, has several automobiles, so let's say I need a car, and, uh, and he loans me his car. And I want the best one too, by the way. But, but let's say he loans me his car. They all have over 200. <clears throat> Well, he loans me his best car with 200,000 miles on it. And I drive it for a couple of months. And finally, I get enough money to get my old car fixed. And, and I come back and, and I say, hey, Clark, Clark, I want to give you this car. What are you going to say? Well, but I'm giving it to you. No, no, I'm giving it to you. See, it's his car. That, that, that's your tithe. God gives you... Whatever you have, 
okay? And he says, give me back 10%. And then we come and we think we're giving him something. You're not. You're just returning to him what's his. And if you keep it in your pocket, I heard a sermon one time that it's dynamite. If you don't give God what's his, he's going to get it one way or the other. You know, you can, you can give it to him, back to him. You can return to him what's his, or you can hold on to it. And the next thing you know, you've got a blown engine or a, uh, a new muffler or a set of tires that need replacing. I mean, it, it's dynamite. It's going to blow up. Why do you want to hold on to what's God's? Because if you give it to him, if you give it back to him, return it to him, do what he said with it, then he's going to bless you over and over and over. But, but then if you really want the blessings, after you've given God what's his, then you see a need. Now you can give. Now, I, I returned his car to him, and, and I was so appreciative, and I knew he had, uh, he, he needed something. I can't think of anything he needs, but, but uh, he needs more patience. So, so I come and, and I say, hey, Clark, I want to give you some patience. Hello? Let's, but any need, if I'm giving when, it's, when, it's, when I'm not giving something, trying to give you something that's already yours, but I give over and above what God said to give. That's a gift. If I give what God says is mine, and, and you give your first to me. How many of you think if, you, uh, if God said, you know, give me 10% of your sheep, how many of you think that you wait until you've got 100 sheep and then give him 10 of them? You're supposed to give him the first 10. Actually, you give him the first one. And then you can have the next nine. You give him the eleventh one. And then you can have the next nine. That's the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to give him the first fruit. And we don't do that either, most of the time. Some of us tithe by saying, well, you know, I'll pay my bills and if I got anything left, I'll give it to God. Hello? There's right ways and there's wrong ways. But if you want to honor God, if you want to to draw near to God and Him draw near to you. And you don't earn that. You're just obeying what He said and then He can bless you, okay? Uh, no one, this is Matthew uh, 6, 19. It says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There will your heart be also. You know, those that, that give the most to cowboys for Jesus care the most about it because their treasure's here. Some of us built this building, and, and many, many of us built this building. Some by giving money, some by giving time, some by, by working their fingers to the bone uh, for long periods of time. And I think that, that those of us that did that care a lot more about everything around here than, than the ones that didn't. That's just human nature. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. If you own some stock, in, in a company, you know, I'll pray for you for one thing, but, but, uh, but, but if you own some stock, do you, do you watch the, your, your electronic devices and see how that stock's doing? Why do you do that? Because they got your money, and, and you want to know what's going on with it, and that's where your heart is. Your heart's where your money is. If you got more invested in the stock market than you got invested in the kingdom of God, you're more interested about the stock market than you are the kingdom of God. Hello? I'm not trying to pound on you to get you to give money to, to this church, although we could use it. I'm trying to pound on you to help you understand that if you, if you get your finances lined up the way God wants them lined up, if you obey His Word, Things are going to go better in your spiritual life, in your physical life, in every area of your life, and in your family. Amen? Amen. It's just a fact of life. Whether you like it or not, it's a fact of life. It's a, it's a spiritual fact. You know, the law of gravity. How many of you can defy the law of gravity? Nobody? 
Well, how do you think you can defy the spiritual laws that God put in effect? Because he put gravity in effect, and he put spiritual laws in effect, and, and there's no difference in them. The spiritual laws are just as, as certain as the law of gravity or any other physical law. Um, no one, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and he'll love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, somebody tell me what mammon is. How many of you think mammon is money? Okay, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Uh, mammon... And, and I'm, I don't have time to, to prove this to you today or to go too deep into it, but I want you to understand it. And, and I'll, I'll probably spend some time next week going over that a little more. Mammon, I believe, is a spirit. If you look up the word in the, in the dictionary, it says it's the persona of, of things of value. It's the persona. It's a spirit. How many of you hear voices when you think about spending money? You know, it says... It says, you need to have that. You know, you can afford that. Go ahead and buy that. Don't hesitate. Go ahead. Oh, wait a minute. I'm talking to some people. Go ahead and do that. You know what that is? That's the spirit of mammon. And it wants you to do. How many of you, you know, did God ever tell you to give somebody $1,000? Anybody? Well, did God ever tell you to give somebody some money? Let's put it that way. How many of you, your initial response was, God, I don't think that's you. Huh? Did you have that initial? Even if you went on and did it, did you argue with him a minute first? That's the spirit of mammon saying, don't do that. Don't do that. God will bless you if you do that. I don't want it. It doesn't say that. It just says, don't do it. That's not God. You can't even afford that. You might need something else with that money next week. Hello? That's the spirit of mammon. And if we don't overcome the spirit of mammon, it leads us astray in all kinds of ways. We have to break the spirit of mammon. Money has a, has a spirit one way or the other. If that money is dedicated to God, it's got God's spirit on it. You remember the, the story about, uh, uh, I'm going to quit in a minute, don't be nervous. I'm sure they're not ready in the kitchen yet. Y'all not ready in the kitchen, are you? Pastor. What's that? Rocks. Pardon? Rocks. Well, I can't see it. Oh, okay. Oh, great. I got 15 minutes. Are y'all okay with that? Okay. Um, you remember the story about Jericho? And uh, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You remember that story? Well, after the walls came tumbling down, God said, he said, uh, he said but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron uh, are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. That's what he said. And, uh, and you remember a guy named Achan? Anybody remember that story? He, he saw all that gold and all that silver and, and all those, those precious things. And, and the spirit of mammon said, nobody will know if you take that. So he took it and he went and he buried it in the middle of his tent. And so then they had this other enemy. Uh, if I can remember what his name was. Uh, uh, Ai, over, over in Ai, uh, that was part of their, their enemies that were always hassling them. And, and uh, so uh, they said, you know, so, y'all go over and spy that out. And they went and spied it out and they came back and said, oh, it's just a little place and they don't have many people. We don't have to send a big army over there. Just send 3,000 guys over a week and wipe it out in a heartbeat. God will be with us and it'll all be good. And they went over there and, and, uh, and the army of Ai chased them all the way back and slaughtered most of them and just, just whooped them good. And, and everybody's saying, well, why did God let us down? Look what he did over here, all these big walls. The walls of Jericho, I mean, they were, they were rooms. They weren't just walls. They were big rooms. People lived in the walls. And, and they marched around it. You remember the story? They marched around it seven times. They took a picture and broke the picture and the walls just fell down and they just... They just devoured the whole city. They, they just whooped them good, okay? And then this little AI, they, they, they got even, you know, for that. They, but, but, and then they said, well, why? 
And then somebody, God, one of the prophets, God said, well, you know, you, you didn't do what you're supposed to with the consecrated things from God. And then they started asking around, and sure enough, one guy, he said, well, you know, I, I couldn't resist, you know. I just kept hearing these voices, and, and it said, you can have that, you can take that, you know, and nobody will ever know. Well, they did know, and you know what happened to him and his family? Boom. Wiped them all out, all of his family. Because that was God's stuff. And God said, don't mess with my stuff. <laughs> How many of you mess with God's stuff sometimes? Without even realizing it. We do that. We do that. You know, as I studied this, I mean, God's checking my heart on some things. And... and, and we all got to check our hearts, okay? And I think what we need to do is, is, uh, is deal with the spirit of mammon. I really do. Because it's a, it's a real thing. And it, how many of you know that, that, that the enemy is a roaring lion prowling around seeking whom he may devour? How many of you want to be devoured? We don't. But, but that's one enemy that we can take authority. I mean, we can take authority over all of them because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did and the authority that he gave us. But we can deal with the spirit of mammon. And we can just ask God to deliver us from it. Remember what we read over here about uh, he'll, he'll, he'll rebuke the devourer? You know, how many of you have, are familiar with deliverance ministry in any way? Hello? Well, you know, how many of you believe that there, there's deep demonic spirits in the world? We know that because Jesus went around casting them out, right? And, you know, some of us have had some demonic spirits cast out of us, you know. Uh, how many you, Jan? <laughs> now, we were involved in the deliverance ministry for a long time. And, uh, and we did that. But, but, you know, you can stand up and... and uh, I know Laurie would never have a demon, but, but, you know, I could stand up if I thought she had one, and I could cast demons out of her all day and command them to leave in the name of Jesus. But if she wants them, and she's going to keep doing the things that let them come in, even if I get them to go, they're going to turn right around and come back, right? But, huh? And, and, some, and bring seven more, yeah, back with them. But, but God said over here, that, that he would rebuke the devourer if we just did what he said. Which is easier. Hello? Where do I go from here, Dennis? <laughs> I've got ten more minutes. Hmm? Well... You can't serve two masters, period. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll despise the one and cling to the other. And, and that other one is the spirit of mammon. That's what it is. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about the spirit of mammon that tries to, to separate you from your money and separate you from serving God the way God wants you to serve him. And he wants to defeat you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy whatever you put your hand to. And we either make a choice and a decision and, and we do what God says to do or, and, and we enjoy when Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. And either you have that abundant life by listening to God and doing what God says or you listen to the spirit of mammon and the rest of the demons of hell and, and you do what they say. It's a choice that we all have to make. And, and you can call it, you know, submitting to God, surrendering to God. You can call it walking in the Spirit. You can call it a lot of different things. But it boils down to Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me, you hear my voice. If you love me, you do what I say. And the difference in, in, the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when they said you have to do this in the Old Testament, it was, it was sometimes you do this or you die. And in the New Testament, it's you do this because you love me or you do this and you don't enjoy life as much. 
Okay? So let's bow our heads. I don't know where anybody is in their life, but I know that with this many people gathered together, some of us are unconsciously and unwittingly serving the spirit of mammon and, and allowing the devil to, to mess in our lives where he doesn't belong. And, uh, and I just, I want you to be happy. I want you to be fulfilled. I want you to be what God wants you to be. Amen. So I just want to, uh, I just want to pray for you. And uh, if, if, if you know that, that you need some prayer in this area, and I, I want everybody to just shut their eyes and keep their head down. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I believe that if you really want something, that you shouldn't be ashamed to, to, to raise your hand and tell God that you want it. You know, he wants us to want him. He wants us to seek him with our whole heart. So I'm just going to give you an opportunity to just raise your hand real quietly right where you are and say, yeah, pray for me. I need to deal with some of this issue. Amen. That's several. That's a few. Yes. Well, if you raised your hand, this prayer is for you. And if you didn't raise your hand and, and it's in your heart, it's still for you, okay? So y'all just pray this with me. Say, Father, I want to serve you with my whole heart. I want to obey all of your word. I don't want to submit to any other spirit but yours. So, Father, if I've let the spirit of mammon rule my life in any area. I rebuke him right now in the name of Jesus. And I tell him to take his hands off of me, off of my money, because my money all came from you. And it's your money. And I want to honor you with my money. I want to honor you with my life. I want to honor you in everything that I do. So, Father, fill me with your Spirit right now and deliver me from the spirit of mammon and any other spirit that's not of you that's working in my life right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Your Word says, if I know the truth, the truth will set me free. So, Father, show me the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Help me to receive your truth, obey your truth, and then set me free, Father. Now, if you prayed that prayer right now, I'm going to speak to that enemy, and I'm going to forbid him to deal in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, all those that prayed that prayer in the sincerity of their heart, Father, I rebuke that spirit of mammon in the name of Jesus. And spirit of mammon, I command you right now to take your hands off of these people in Jesus' name. I ask you, God, to open their eyes to see the truth and to see the areas where that demon has, has messed their lives up, messed their finances up, kept them from enjoying you as much as is possible to do, Father. And Lord, I speak life into everyone that's, that's really seeking you with their whole heart, Father. Lord, I ask you to touch them and minister life and peace and health to them, Father. And Lord, I ask you to give us a spirit of obedience, a spirit of love, joy, and peace, gentleness, kindness, meekness, and self-control, Father, so that we can glorify your name and walk in your ways and walk in your love, Father, all the days of our life. And Lord, just bless them all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, Father, you said your word wouldn't return void, but it would accomplish what you sent it forth for, Father. So I trust you for that today. And I thank you that you're doing it in hearts and lives right now in the name of Jesus. Okay, I'm scared to ask this, but how many of y'all still glad you came to church today? <laughs> Woo, all right, hallelujah.